plan A was I was going to talk about the SDR Plus and using that for Radio Joe, which is really neat. And it's 150 bucks, plugs right in. It's, it's just neat. Uh, I didn't quite get that finished, and I was going to do that with 1420 in the hydrogen line. I didn't get that finished. Tom said, hey, you're giving a talk. What's your talk on? And so I said, all right, what's going to be fun that I can think of real quick? And I said, E.T. Well, being an old geezer, you folks won't understand this. You're much too young. Uh, in the mid 80s, there was a PC adventure game called uh, Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> Searching for love in all the wrong places. So I said, gee, this is kind of way that we, the way we've been searching for ET. I mean, 65 years. He hasn't talked to us. Why? So I kind of thought, well, let's talk about the search for ET. And perhaps we should accept that after 65 years, we might need to change the methodology in what we're doing. So let's kind of talk about that. So searching for ET goes back a long time. The New York Times, as you know, only reports the news that's fit to print. And the New York Times is never wrong. No matter what they say about Donald Trump, they're never wrong. Or Hillary, they're never wrong. So Percival Lowell discovered canals on Mars. And he mapped it out. The New York Times reported that the Martian engineers were a heck of a lot better than the Earth engineers because they could build canals rapidly. That was about 1908. Does anybody know what Percival Lowe, Lowell saw on Mars? Canal. Hmm? Canals. Yeah, which he took his canals, the Italian word. But what, what was he mapping out? The back of his eyes. The young lady in the back yeah. of the room. Well, it was, it was the blood vessel in his eyes that he was seeing. Yeah, he mapped out the blood vessels in his eyes. Next time you go to your eye doctor, ask him that. And he'll, he'll tell you that they like maps. Okay, so uh, Tesla. Not the automobile guys. The real guy. The real guy. Uh, swore that he heard signals from Mars. If you look at the timings there, he might have heard some of the early sounds from Jupiter. <coughs> the uh, non-IO storms. <coughs> Marconi, not to be outdone, said he heard the same signals. And then there was a report in 1901 of light flashes from Mars. <coughs> so, you're all familiar with the Drake equation. When we talked about setting 10, 15 years ago, we said, all right, you know, Frank Drake thinks there's maybe 10,000 planets that would fit this mold. We'll talk about that in a bit. I'm not going to go through that. You should be familiar with it. Uh, Enrico Fermi worked on a physics project, 42 to 45 and maybe after, uh, at Los Alamos, if memory serves me. This is what he said. If they're out there, why don't we see them? Are they here? And when you look around, maybe you think some of them are. <laughs> if you go to trailer parks, you find them. Yeah. Uh, they can't get here, it's too far. Well, that's reasonable. Civilizations always kill themselves. And if you think about that, you know, we're probably somewhere close to annihilating ourselves. We're certainly annihilating all of the animals around us. So uh, that's possible. They watch our wars and we frighten them. We're too dumb to join the galactic club, so they just kind of watch us. Uh, we're a zoo. 
And I think there's been some sci-fi books out of the 50s in Sci-Fi Magazine and Analog that did that one. And of course, we're a simulation. And of course, we could be machines that were going wrong and where people built us as uh, carbon-based bipeds, machines, with self-awareness. And the question comes up, does self-awareness question us, uh, separate us from other animals? Well, for those of you that have dogs and cats, I'm sure they have self-awareness, or at least the ones I've seen. So, we need a definition of life. About 1944, Schrodinger, who was famous for his cat experiment, he put the cat in a box with poison, so the cat was neither dead or alive, and you didn't know until you opened the box. And if the poison went off, the cat was dead if it didn't. And if you watch the Big Bang Theory, you have seen this repeated over and over and over again. So anyway, that was this guy. So what he said was that life avoids entropy. And that, that follows the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, living matter can po postpone entropy by taking nutrients. If you can see, I take nutrients. Some of the others don't take as much. Uh, but the problem is metabolism may not be a marker of life because there's some geological things that you could say, well, they have a metabolism. So it's not perfect. And after death, you know, we decompose. So entropy occurs. So I thought that was a good definition. Seth Shostak uh, from uh, the SETI Institute was here Saturday night and he presented his definition of intelligent life is somebody that can build a radio telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so those of you in this room who can build a radio telescope are considered intelligent. The others uh, anybody know what this is on the side here? DNA. Very good. All right. So where have we looked? We looked in the water hole. And on the Sarah list a month or so ago, one of the guys who will go on name said, why would they look there? It's too noisy. Well, it's actually very quiet. And if you take a look as you come down from the galactic noise, as you get to about just below 1 gigahertz, 800, 900 megahertz, uh, it starts to quiet. You get into where hydrogen is, neutral hydrogen, cold hydrogen, H1, uh, up to OH hydroxyl, which is 1635, 1665. There's four in that laser. Uh, that's a quiet area. So the original thought was to look there, because ET, if he was carbon-based, water would be important. So that's where a lot of the searches go on. However, it doesn't matter where the search goes on because we don't know where they're sending or if they're sending. So Osma was the first search. And for those that have attended the 40 foot talk, that feed is on the 40 footer. So Drake started this. He looked at a couple of stars uh, that were nearby. He expected to hear something within six weeks, two months, 65 years ago, perhaps not. So where do we want to look? We want to look in something called the Goldilocks zone. That's the technical term. Uh, circumstellar habitable zone is the other. Rocky planets, we think they should be our size because we're our size. Uh, but they could be larger or smaller, depending. And nitrogen skies, because we were about 80% nitrogen. Uh, liquid water and carbon-based. As I refer to my wife as a carbon-based biped spousal unit. <laughs> so 
then you could also say, well, we could look at silicon-based life forms too, and other life forms we don't understand. And the problem is we don't know what we don't know. So we only, you know, our movement is very slow going forward. So where have we been? These are the searches. And we kind of get up to about 1981. NASA is doing a SETI search. Proxmire, I believe, out of Ohio, uh, killed him. So then the SETI Institute was formed. So that was just bang. So we we're no longer doing the SETI search. Uh, we've got the wow signal. And, you know, where have we looked? We're, most of our searches have been in the waterhole. There's been some phenomenal searches. Uh, Charles Osborne and I were involved in a Georgia Tech project uh, using Woodbury Telescope. And then uh, the SETI Institute, when they took over the 140 down here, used that as a flutter receiver. So if the 140 received something, they would immediately swing the Woodbury Telescope to see if they would hear the same thing. Uh, Optical SETI is looking for a flash. The Planetary Society is doing that. There's several other institutions doing that. Uh, it was over well over 3,000 hours, so occasional hits, none repeated. What they're looking for is a laser flash. So, Big Ear, uh, Ohio State had this huge antenna uh, when John Krauss was there. And then after Krauss retired, it's now a golf course. But anyway, this was about the best signal that we have seen. And uh, Tau Sagittaria was the closest star. Uh, it was in the beam long enough. And of course, there's a, what was written in this was a uh, grad student or, or postdoc who, I've forgotten his name, but who had done this. Anyway, that was that. Current and past, uh, the Allen Array has been working. And the Allen Array is, is looking at M stars. M stars are dim stars, but their life is extremely long. The thought is, if a planet is in the habitable zone around an M star, it's got billions and billions of, you know, we're, we're a 10 billion year star. They're 50, 100 billion years star. So the chances of having life there develop would be really good. So the SETI Institute's now looking there. But I mean, we've done lots and lots of projects and we just haven't really found anything. So we got SETI at home. And they used to publish what they had found. I have not seen that in the past couple of years. Has anyone seen anything from SETI at home on what's being done? Okay. Uh, but uh, this is probably five years old. 2,500 heard once, 14 twice. So, but the SETI at home process is still going on. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's uh, using a feed on Arecibo and they download that and then you download the data sets and you run it on your PC when it's not doing anything. Uh, I also run Einstein at home, which is looking for gravity waves. So. All right, optical SETI, searching for pulses. And if you look, an F-type star, you know, that's a photon emitted. And using telescopes and, and pulsars, and we have a friend who uh, uh, Dr. Michelle Chin worked at uh, Jefferson Lab building big lasers. And, uh, there's some talk that I think the Navy shot a satellite out of orbit with a laser. So there's, you know, you can really make them powerful. 
Anyway, that's, that's the other search that's going on. Kepler has discovered 95% of the planets larger than Jupiter. Uh, excuse me, Neptune. And why larger than Neptune? Well, to be honest, when things are far away, if they're bigger, they're easier to see. So when you look for small stuff, it's tougher. So everybody says, well, all the planets are too big. Well, yeah, but we haven't seen all the planets. All we see are the ones that are easy to find. So we have to kind of understand that. Uh, it's monitoring 140,000, 145,000 main sequence stars. Uh, Kepler had a problem, it's been repaired. It's, it's amazing, the engineers who work on this stuff, that when things fail, they come up with creative ways. I mean, uh, Apollo 13 failed, and they were able to save the guys, and they had to do some unnatural acts to do it, but they used the limb as a lifeboat to get them back. I mean, so if you look, we do have good engineers. Perhaps not as good as the Martian engineers, but <laughs> I think pretty good. All right. The way the naming works, A is the sun. If we look at our solar system, A is our sun, B is Mercury, C is Venus, D is Earth. So that's the way that they, they name the planets is their location from the sun. Uh, we think that it's rocky, 10% larger than the Earth, it's in Cygnus. So this would be pretty ideal for, for life. It orbits in 130 days. It's an M dwarf, which is a cool star. So you, you're closer to get to the Goldilocks zone. And uh, we think that could harbor life. The 21 planets should, uh, should be 39, I believe. I thought I had changed that. Uh, and now we can have a targeted search. We can start looking at stars where we know we have planets that have the conditions we think to harbor life, or at least some of them. Uh, the issue is 480 light years away, inverse square law. They've got to be transmitting with a heck of a large signal for us to hear them. Um, Drake's search was, oh gosh, five light years and probably eight light years away. And the eight light years he didn't think he could see with the tattle, the 85 foot dish. Okay, so we're well over 1700 planets that have been detected by various means. If you, if you do the math, in the statistics, eh, maybe 40 billion planets in our galaxy that are like the Earth. Uh, for every fifth Earth-like planet, eh, it could harbor life. So that gives us 11 billion possibilities. So the Drake equation has changed dramatically over 65 years. Drake, you know, had gotten up to 10,000. Now we're saying 11 billion. And in 16, that's where the number 36 planets are, uh, are the best opportunities. So why are we doing the radio search? Because we know how to do it. We're good at it. 65 years, you get pretty good at anything. Uh, we make a lot of assumptions. What frequency to search? I don't know. Let's use the water hole because the water hole is where it's quiet. And it's water in another, another solarization would think that. Uh, the signals could be a flash. They may not be continuous. And, and the issue that we have, I need two volunteers. One, come on up here. This is fun. Okay. 
Stay here. So two, two old. Stay eyes. here. Okay. Shut your eyes. Put your fingers out. Uh, one finger. One finger. One hand. One finger. Okay. Now start turning around. Let me know when they hit each other. When the fingers point to each other, let me know. We won't do this for more than two hours. All right, guys, thanks. Okay. What you have seen is a demonstration of ET on one planet sending a signal and the SETI Institute on this planet receiving the signal. So what did we notice? Their fingers never touched, right? So that's the issue, is you get a small beam, the two, they're swinging, and the opportunity for them to hit each other is slim to none. And then if you look at the amount of sky that we've covered, it ain't that much. So our rotation, the galactic rotation, the rotation of the other planet, it just really makes it tough. Uh, the issue of the inverse square law is we doubled the distance, we have the signal, so the farther away, the less opportunity to detect. Um, and who's going to fund it? Proxmire said the government ain't funding. So right now, uh, HP, uh, the vice president of HP, funded it, uh, the original search after 81. If you look at uh, Bob Allen of Microsoft is the one who who uh, funded the building of uh, the array. So it's all private funding, people who are interested. And you get your name on the project. So after 65 years, we need to start thinking about a new way forward. Uh, you know, the, they're like us and have killed themselves off. I mean, our chances of surviving another 20 years, sorry kids, it's going to be tough. Although you could go back to 1960 and say the same thing. We have had five opportunities to destroy this world. Uh, the military had a training tape in, and the training tape showed missiles launching from Russia. We went on full alert. The missileers were called up. The missileers got their keys out. They armed their missiles. And when you look at the early 70s, Minuteman alone could throw 1.2 trillion tons of TNT with an accuracy of maybe an eighth of a mile. But when you got six, seven mile kill radius, it's not all that important. Titan IIs had a 25 mile kill radius. To say nothing of the submarines, the B 52s, and everything else. So we just would have ended the world. It would have been safe for alligators and cockroaches. Uh, so we have that hanging over us still. Uh, well, they're not transmitted. We're transmitted once, three minutes. We'll talk about that in a, in a minute or two. Uh, so we need technologies to look at the artifacts of life. And we should keep the optical and radio going because who knows, we may get lucky. Uh, astrobiology. If we start looking, we have this huge number of planets that may harbor life, may not be intelligent life. They may not know how to build a radio telescope, but it may be life. Uh, so what do we do? We search for oxygen, carbon dioxide, and as the Scots say it, methane. Methane. Uh, so we look for stars around G, K, M, the dimmer stars, because then those stars burn longer and a better chance to start life. Okay, so what do we have on Earth? that we can use Earth as a laboratory for ET and for life on other planets. So we've got microbes living in heart, hot tar. We've got 
stuff that can live in 5,000 grays of radioactive waste. And what do we take? Three grays in, in a week with dead? Something like that. It's not very much. Uh, we have microbes living in boiling water, these water jets under the sea. Uh, you got stuff living in the Dead Sea, which is an extremely high salt content. <coughs> Things living in Antarctica. Uh, a jellyfish like guy in high sulfide. You dig down a mile, you find life. How can that be? Uh, and then water bears. Water bears can go from 194 degrees to minus 321 Fahrenheit. And they can live in space. What they do is they, they go dormant and they come back to life. So on Earth here, we've got some very, very extreme microbes. Uh, Lynn and I were out in Yellowstone National Park and there was a bunch of students who had microscopes and scooping up water out of these ponds out there, the hot ponds, and uh, started talking to them. And they were taking an astrobiology course at the University of Washington. Uh, I took an astrobiology course from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, so we're beginning to rethink how to look for ET. Uh, and there's been a number of bacteria experiments on the ISS. One of the concerns when uh, Mir came back was that it would be carrying bacteria from outer space that had collected. And they had found bacteria that had collected on the surface of Mir and on some of the experiments that they had done. The thought was that when Mir entered the atmosphere, it would burn up and kill them off. So hopefully they were right. Okay, this is my favorite bacteria. When Charles Osborne gets me upset, I'm going to get some of these and put them in his lab. <laughs> but can you imagine a bacteria that lives on electrons? And that's what it feeds on, electrons. Can you imagine your cell phone being infected? <laughs> but, you know, and we found two, and they're discovering more. They just haven't, you know, done enough research to, to get them and say yes, in fact. So my point very simply is, is that if you want to look for unusual life, this planet's a good place to start. Uh, so using this information, it helps us when we look out beyond. Uh, so we still think that life should be carbon-based. Because when you look out, when you look at Pluto, Pluto looks like every other rocky planet, except it's got calcium chloride. I guess they store that for when it snows and they need to salt the roads. Isn't that what you guys in the Midwest do? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, and then, okay, this is the fun part. If you take a geology course and some of the life courses in the universities here, they say, okay, Early Earth had 2% oxygen. It wasn't until photosynthesis started that they started to produce more oxygen. And then we got to the great oxidization period, as I fumble through the word, where we get up to 26% oxygen. Lots of fires, but a big burst in growth for animal, animal life. Uh, so we have that. We also produce methane. Cows, Irishmen drinking murky stout. God forbid it should be Guinness. Uh, but yeah, a lot of methane. 
So we've got these signatures now, and ozone is a great marker because all that oxygen gets up in the stratosphere, and when it gets up there, it turns to ozone, so that's an easy marker. So if we begin to start looking at that, and vegetation is detectable because it reflects IR light. So if we see a lot of IR reflection, then we have an opportunity. So I just said we should use the biomarkers, and now I'm saying, eh, maybe not because there's geological things that can do this. So a single biomarker may not be proof. We need to look for more. Uh, but if we can find water vapor, that can increase our confidence. If we see IR reflection, uh, we see a lot of carbon compounds. If we see it, see CO2. Uh, or we have the absence of light. Perhaps we're looking for the wrong things. Or the light resides subsurface. You know, the jury's still out on life on our planets, on Mars, maybe subsurface. The early experiment that was done in the mid-70s, they said, yeah, there's life. No, there's not. And then the meteor said, yeah, there's life. No, there's not. So it's kind of maybe. We just need a better, a better test. Uh, and I think we're, we're trying to do that. Uh, so we may find planets that are habitable, uh, but because of some c catastrophe, big media hitting, killing all the dinosaurs, and knocking life out uh, in extinction. Uh, so, but there's a lot of places to look. So, as I said, IR excess, if we start looking, and we see a lot of IR coming off a planet. That may be vegetation. It may be light forms doing things. So that's a, that's a thought. And you target stars that are over a billion years old. And why is that? Because we think it took at least a billion years for us to begin to develop life here in the earliest forms. Uh, and calcium is absorption is another marker. Pollution. Uh, the James Webb te Telescope will have the ability to look for exoplanet pollution, although 1.2 to 1.7 days of integration, they may not do a lot of it. But that's another opportunity. Or we could have alien life thriving on CO2. We have plants that catch animals, clothes, and eat them. So there could be plant forms, life forms, uh, that have some degree of intelligence. Smart vegetable. Yeah. Uh, anybody think a plant can see? Raise your hand if you think. So we've got a handful of people that think plants can see. Okay. Uh, they may not be able to build a radio telescope. But plants have the ability to detect sunlight and light, and they have the ability to, to detect what frequency it is. Uh, University of uh, 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 Tel Aviv did a course, and the course was called What a Plant Knows, and it talks about the, the plant's ability to see. They have proven that it can't hear, so playing music for your plant isn't going to help it. Uh, but it has a number of senses, um, and it can actually turn to the light. And if you cut a plant, you can kill it, except for grass and weeds. Uh, so we're kind of saying that this life may be with a, a, a very heavy planet, very thick atmosphere. And Gleasy 5, uh, 581D may fit those conditions. So there's, there's lots of different things we should look for. Okay, as I said, when we started as a planet after the first billion years and we started to get some microbes and then the microbes started to become uh, plant-like, 
and that plant life started to absorb the CO2, use the carbon for food, and emit the oxygen as a waste product. So we're at 16, 18% oxygen today, and that's the plant life. So as we talk about uh, the problems with the uh, greenhouse gases and CO2, I'll tell you, those trees out there are just delighted. They get all that extra food. So uh, where do we look? 513 nanometers in O2. Uh, and if we detect a higher than 2% content of oxygen in a planet's atmosphere, that's a marker for carbon-based animal life. So, I think they also said that uh, well, oxygen is very reactive, so if there's not a process that keeps renewing it, and it was somehow created naturally, it would disappear in a relatively short time. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, for those of you that live in the Midwest or West Virginia, your cars are an example of that, of entropy. And as they begin to rot out and rust out, with the oxygen. Okay. Here's a scary one. You've seen the articles on artificial intelligence. Uh, you may know of Watson, IBM's intelligent, uh, artificial intelligent, which can do lots of good things. Uh, oh, I hate to use this term. University of Georgia, uh, as uh, artificial intelligence, although I think most of the students fit that category. Um, I'm a Georgia Tech guy. So. And I have a t-shirt that said, friends don't re let uh, friends wear red and black, which are the colors of Georgia. Uh, so by about 2050, we should have artificial machines that can think for themselves. If you look today, and you go in your pocket, and you pull out one of these, you know, 32 gigabytes of memory on this. This room could hold six gigabytes of memory in 1983. So we've come a, a long way in Moore's Law. So as we continue doing that, and we build these artificial intelligence that have the ability, and if you look back when I joined IBM in 64, they had machines designing machines. Machines were designing the machines so that the engineers just put in a Boolean expression and the circuits were drawn and, and put together and matched. So that's been going on for 60 plus years. And if you look today at the devices in our pockets, uh, we're really good at it, or the machines are really good at it. So we, we really stand that possibility. And then for you sci-fi fans, you know, we need to go to 2001, a space odyssey. Hal. Hal is one before IBM. H-I-A-B. He got it. Uh, that his job was to protect the mission at all costs. So what did he do? He killed off the astronauts. So when you start thinking about artificial intelligence and using that to help us and to control us as our society gets more and more to the name society, uh, then we'll have machines that will control us and slap our paw when we do something wrong. Uh, when they start designing smarter and smarter machines, they may realize that we're a detriment to their society. So they just do away with us. Now, we have a planet with silicon-based life forms. Think about that. It's not that far away from happening, that possibility. Uh, and the question is, would they look for other civilizations? Has this happened in other worlds? 
I mean, it's pure speculation in science fiction, but it's something to think about. Okay, moving on. So far, it's like playing the lottery. Drake picked two stars because they were nearby. And they fit what he thought would work 65 years ago. Didn't work. So we're looking at things and we're not really finding anything. We're to the point now that we're teaching astrobiology, you can get a degree in astrobiology, and we're putting space probes out there that can do this detection. So we're getting closer and closer to being able to find life out there. May not be intelligent, but it'll give us proof that there is life out there. The other problem is the distance. And if you look at Einstein's special theory of relativity, for us to get to the nearest star, nearest star is uh, Alpha uh, Centauri. What's that, four and a half light years away or something? 4.3. 4.3, thank you. So if I travel at 98% of the speed of light, how long is it going to take me to get there? About 4.1, 3.8, 4.1. So you said, wait a second. Within the spacecraft, the time gets all screwed for yeah. Einstein's rule. So, make it interesting. And, and then we have particles that hit the Earth that we detect on Earth. That lifespan is too short for them to get to the Earth once they hit the atmosphere and we see them. So a lot of strange things happen when you start looking at the theory of relativity. And I thought it was a great course to start with three fingers of scotch and midway through another three fingers because you start doing the math and you say, how can this be? Anyway, uh, so I mean, it's, it's kind of like the, the lottery right now. Um, maybe not as good. So where are we looking? Well, we might be looking in the wrong places. Although the SETI Institute, its new way is, is getting closer and closer. Why haven't we found them? They're too far away. They're just developing. I mean, we've had uh, this planet's been wiped out five times. And depending on who you talk to, some people will say we're in our sixth as we're killing off other life forms. Uh, so that's, that's an issue. You get hit by a big comet, what does it do? Uh, you look at what the tsunami did in Japan, and you see that in that part of the world. Uh, we haven't found enough planets in the Goldilocks zone to look at. What did I say, 36 to date? Uh, and, you know, it's no better than playing the lottery. We just haven't, we haven't found enough, we haven't looked at enough. Uh, so what have we done? We transmitted the message from Arecibo, three minutes long. We pointed it at M13, 25,000 light years away. That's a globular cluster, absolutely gorgeous in the telescope. Uh, near or in Hercules, if memory serves me. So we sent this out. Drake and uh, Sagan came up with this. So if somebody gets this message and returns it, it's 50,000 years from now. So that's part of the issue. You kids going to be around in 50,000 years? I don't think I am. But, you know, if you don't, if you don't try, you're just not going to find it. You know, if you don't play the lottery, you're not going to win. Uh, so the end all is with all the stuff that we transmit, four light years away, you're not going to see it. The only thing that you can see that we transmit is Arecibo and some laser experiments. But that's not a purposeful, I want to contact ET. That brings us to the next question, you know? 
I was out with Charles and one of the other guys, Bear Hunter. I went out and Bear started to, ch to chase me. I ran back to the cabin, I opened the door, the bear ran in, I yelled, Charles, there's yours, I'll go find mine. <laughs> uh, what happens when we find them? Will this create panic? Well, first of all, Lowell said that the Martian engineers were better than the Earth engineers. Didn't create panic. When Tesla said he heard the Martian, Martian said he Martian was true. Could have been even been American was true because nobody can interpret that. Um, as opposed to international was true. Um, that. And then Marconi agreed with him that nobody panicked. There wasn't panic in the streets of New York City. So more than likely, there wouldn't be panic. There's a number of, there's politics of dealing with ET. Uh, there is a protocol that's out there that says this is what you do. Uh, and then there's a group in Hawaii, the Exo Political Institute. Look them up. They're kind of a little bit over the top on this. But there's lots of information there uh, for, for how to handle contact. And of course, if you saw the picture, how many people saw the movie Contact or read Sagan's book? Okay. You do know that the players were real people. Right? Uh, the actress, what was her name? Judy Yeah, she was playing the director of the SETI Institute. <coughs> Remember the blind programmer? He, he almost played himself. Uh, you had Proxmire that came in and took over once ET was found. That's who that was, the congressman, the senator. Uh, and then the guy who went up in the ISS, who had funded the second uh, experiment, was the vice president of HP. So if you Google the movie Contact, it will take you through the players that Carl Sagan used when he wrote the book. So it's, it's, it's kind of fun. And then Sagan used uh, Kip Thorne out of Caltech, and his grad students worked on the wormholes for how to beat the speed of light. So the issues, there's a book out there called The Rare Earth. I've read it. It's interesting. It says that we're alone. I don't think so. Uh, in 1951, the Pope said, yeah, it's possible that there can be other light on other planets, and they may even have other gods. So he was okay with that. Uh, where do we look? Don't know. Where are they broadcasting? We don't know. And the most important one, which I remember from business, is you don't know what you don't know. Okay. This is one of my favorite expressions. Science, my lads, is made up of a series of mistakes. But these mistakes, which is it is useful to make, because they lead us little by little to the truth. And if you look at science or astronomy 60 years ago, and you take an astronomy textbook from 60 years ago and take one from today, they ain't the same. I mean, we've developed that much technology and knowledge in 60 years. So that's it. Thank you so much. Questions?